Um, Sam Thomas was to join me today, and he called me at 1 o'clock, and while well, I thought it was humorous, he didn't think so, he was served with a <laughs> he was served <laughs> with a notice of a client that was, there was a TRO hearing scheduled at 4 o'clock this afternoon. And my first question was, is how do you make yourself to be available to be served? And he said, well, I guess I need to walk down the back stairs from now on. But in any event, he thought he was going to be able to move that and has not been able to. And he's, uh, he uh, is very sorry that he can't be here, but, but I, I can understand why. Um, this session, we're really going to finish up what we had started last month relating to the criteria to be used by the board in deciding applications for variances. And then, given that we are um, having an administrative hearing tonight relative to an appeal, an administrative appeal, thought it would be appropriate for us to review uh, those procedures in the code and also the pre procedures that this board has adopted associated with that. Um, I don't, have you all met Emily Preston? Okay, she's uh, uh, with me this evening and Emily, you can jump in anytime if you, if you would like to, to do so. Um, last week when we talked about the variance, or last month when we talked about variances, we we obviously spent a considerable about amount of time talking about requirement one, um, which always seems to be the one to cause the most issue as to um, what is narrow, what is shallow, what is the shape, is it exceptional? These, all of these words that are used in connection with the findings that have to be done, um, not created by the owner, and then the strict application would require the owner not to enjoy the same benefits that other people in the same zoning district would have to opt, would have the ability to enjoy. Um, we had uh, Mr. Dillard and we had Ms. Butler here along with me uh, going through these conversations concerning concerning this this uh, one item. Uh, and as you all know, you have to find all five. And that's the way our ordinance is written today, and that's what, what we're governed under, that you have to, have to do that. And I know that, that that's been an issue with this, uh, with this board. Um, however, that's, that's where we are until such time as we adopt something differently. Don, how are you? Good to see you. No, that's, that's just fine. Thank you. Um, so are there any follow-up questions or anything that you all want to talk about this one issue one before we go on okay all right <clears throat> requirement number two which we did get into the requested variance does not go beyond the minimum necessary to afford relief and does not constitute a grant of special privilege inconsistent with the limitations upon other properties in the zoning district in which the subject property is located, okay? Can't go beyond the minimum necessary and can't be a grant of a special privilege. Now, I think the minimum necessary is one that you know, we can sit there and, and examine and probably come to, while it may be a subjective conclusion, but, but it's probably more objective than anything else. You only need so much you can get away with, with less. And I've, and I've seen this board make those decisions and, and, and make the conditions as far as the fact that it would be different. But if you're talking about granting of a special privilege in a zoning district, I mean, that one's a little more, more difficult uh, that you have to find that, that that's not taking place. And I don't think we really ever question that issue have we done that in the past where we question whether, well, if we give this privilege to you, this is a special privilege? I think we've discussed it in the past where uh, I believe staff's uh, interpretation of that is within the immediate zoning district in that neighborhood where I would have read it previously as R75 citywide as R75. So mm -hmm. if it existed somewhere else in R75, I would have thought it would apply to R75 across the board. Well, we seem to be a little more restrictive with that. 
as far as the neighborhood is concerned, I, you know, I would, um, you know, I think that's that's an argument somebody could make because I, you know, as far as if there's a, priv a privilege associated with one neighborhood, then why shouldn't another neighborhood have that same privilege? I mean, that's really where somebody would would have to come and and do that. And I don't, um, Susan is can you Susan or Ben can you give an example where there may be a special privilege issue that you've seen? at it more as what's kind of around it versus you're looking at the whole city right is that yep. what yep. um you know I, I think that maybe we just look at that differently I, I think that we're looking at the characteristics of what's around it versus you know four miles away I, yeah what I mean, would be an example I'll be honest, I don't know if there's a clear example that I could share with you, but in essence, if we're talking about neighborhoods, each neighborhood has its own distinct look and feel. Right. Um, and even within R75, there are going to be R75s on the south end of the city that may be more non-conforming. A lot of records where um, it, to the north, R75s may be conforming. So what, in terms of the staff's perspective, uh, we do take that into consideration in terms of the zoning district, mm -hmm. uh, but typically it's associated uh, and what I mean by the immediate area is more or less maybe like a mile or two radius. Uh, but to account the entire city and all the zoning or similar zoning districts, it becomes a little difficult because each neighborhood does have its own feel to mm -hmm. it. And you do have different character throughout the city. So. Well, yeah, I, th I think the rationale behind it makes sense to me. Um, it's more of just a, a point to make that you know, are you being inconsistent with the zoning, which is the way our ordinance reads, mm -hmm. or are you being inconsistent with the zoning of that neighborhood? I think anybody could come in, pending, pending a rewrite of our ordinance, somebody could come in and say, well, the staff said it's inconsistent, but here in this neighborhood four miles away, that's the, the majority of the houses. Why would it be any different when we're zoned the same? Right? But you could have the same zoning on the north side of town that you have on the south side of town but the way that zoning is used could be different in that someone could go to the maximum lot size of that zoning on the north side of town versus the minimum possible on the south side of town, still have the same zoning but have a total different character. Yeah. Well, one, one thing that took place last month was, was the zoning decision associated with, and I don't recall the neighborhood, where there was a deck built on a drainage easement and they wanted to enclose that deck, and um, and there became you know a real issue as to um, the fact that we would be there approving their ability to improve that property and also create more runoff, um, and whether or not that's something that that should be considered. Now, the argument was. And when it came back to, and, and jump in when you want to, Ben, here, is that, well, everybody else in our neighborhood has built their deck on this drainage easement, and a number of them have already been, you know, approved to enclose the deck with a porch or whatever it may be. And I think that was, that, uh, well, that would have been a special privilege in my mind that why would anybody be crazy enough to build an improvement on a drainage easement? And is the city crazy enough to authorize them to do it, to permit it? Uh, and in that situation, we got a release from them. But still, you know, all of a sudden, this we were telling this guy, he possibly couldn't do something that everybody else was able to do in his neighborhood. No, that would have been done under the county. So, but still, I mean, how do you... Um, you have to, you know, have to come to that sort of judgment or whatever may take place, and that's, you know, as you all sit in this this position, you know, those are decisions that have to be made. If if I could, I think the hardest part with all of this is that these are objective criteria, but we have these five reasons because all of you are probably going to have a different opinion on different things, and it's to help make it an objective decision collectively, if that makes sense. And so that's, that, that's why it sounds a little, there's always going to be potential, there's always going to be an attorney that could come in and, and argue 
that it should be interpreted a different way. And so this is to try to make it a little bit more uniform among the different cases. And, and you all have certainly impressed upon me that you, you do have the ability to differ in opinions. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, so that can take place. I, I, I'm sorry. I just walked in in the last okay. minute. And I apologize for being late. That's all right, I blame it on the traffic or the fact that we got a north side. Blame it on North Druid Hills there. Road. But <clears throat> it just not not having heard what you were saying, but just sort of walking mm -hmm. in on the conclusion. It it, it almost sounds like, and, and I don't know whether it was hypothetical or, or or what, but it was an application for a deck onto a drainage yep. easement that prior decks had been permitted improvidently. And, and in my way of thinking, I just to have approved, to approve it again is just sort of compounding a mistake. You know, nine mistakes have happened, you're the tenth applicant, are we just going to go, well, you know, stuff happens, we're just going to go on? Or, I mean, in, in my mind, I, I, I don't know if that situation were to come in front of us. For all I it, know, I may have voted. It did, it yeah, did. I probably voted for you, in it favor did, of it. It did, it but did just, last month. Uh, oh, I'd just like to clarify. Actually, it didn't go before oh. the ZBA. I think it, <laughs> it was the initial discussion to go to that route. Okay. But we did not bring it before the ZBA. Okay. Uh, it was, yeah. All right. It was administratively handled. I, I could have said yes yesterday. And uh huh. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> <No today. laughs> but I mean, that's a good example of, again, talking about the, the uniqueness of individual neighborhoods. Um, because there's characteristics of the neighborhood that con that were established before we even incorporated as a city. Um, so we are going to be running into a lot of those situations. And another thing that sort of I wanted to bring up, it, it was another uh, variance, but I mean, again, I don't remember what the variance number was, what the exact address was, but it's an RA5 zoning, I believe. So RA5 is a little bit different across the board, even from developments. <coughs> Some people decide to utilize all 50% in terms of law coverage because that is the, the maximum that's permitted. Uh, but some other RA5, you may not see it exceeding or meeting that maximum. You may see it substantially lower, maybe more conforming with your typical single-family detached R75, R100, 35% law coverage rule. So in essence, the purpose of a variance, I, and tell me if I'm wrong, um, Tom, is generally speaking, it's based upon sort of the unique merits of that specific requests related to that subject property because even within a specific neighborhood one lot could have issues related to topographic conditions one may be fairly flat so you have to sort of treat it on its own merits based upon what they're requesting and the the conditions of that property if that makes sense that, that's why we have you're absolutely right Ben that's why we have variances is to avoid regulatory taking claims that the city has taken the property without due compensation you allow these variances and these special exceptions just in, in wide out zoning theory to help provide some relief that doesn't mean that they're always necessary but it's to help there being regulations that are so strict that it constitutes a taking and, and not to oversimplify but um, you can't just take a general approach across the board and you have to consider each case on its own merit. And I think that's kind of collectively what we're all saying here. Yep. Right. I mean, we could, I mean, the example that we all dealt with was the Walgreens case and we could argue infinitum relating to, to those issues that were there. Um, but you saw it all in connection with that case and there were different conclusions as you know of the board members associated with that as to what they were finding um, neither was right neither was wrong I mean that's sort of the way that that you look have to look at it um, that was there the third is the grant of the variance will not materially be detrimental to the public welfare or injurious to the property or improvements in the zoning district in which the subject property is located I mean that's you can you can you know that's sort of like pornography you'll know it when you see it and um, and uh, you can look at it and, and find that it would very well be so that would be there as far as what could be detrimental and harmful to the public um, 
then you've got this other finding, which I've seen you all uh, discuss, is the literal interpretation and strict application of the applicable provisions or requirements of this chapter would cause undue and necessary hardship, not merely impose a casual discretionary inconvenience upon the applicant or his slash her assigns. An undue, unnecessary hardship if you don't grant that variance. And, you know, that's a tough one. That really is. Particularly when we see the, you know, the residential um, lot sizes that we have in the city and the constant issue concerning setbacks, whether they be front yard, rear yard, or sidebacks. I mean, the majority of the cases that you're you're hearing this evening relate to that one issue. And you have to find that if you don't grant that, it's an undue unnecessary hardship. And you say, well, you just build a smaller house. But then you have the argument, well, you go back up here and you say, yeah, but everybody else in my zoning district is being able to build a house this side. Why can't we build a house this side? So then, so then you're pushing yourself back up to that if the strict application of what you're saying puts you at a disadvantage over other people in your zoning district, then it becomes a due and unnecessary hardship. So, you know, the relationship of going all the way back up to number one to what you're dealing with with number four are really, you know, part of it. That, you know, true, you could have, you know, you could have built something smaller or that hardship, um, while you're not supposed to take into consideration any economic hardship, but, you know, you, you do think about it. I mean, you think about it in the commercial sense that if we're not able to do this, then there's no way the project can work. And that's, you know, that's, that's a hardship. But if it's an economic, it's, it's not one that, that, that should be taken into consideration regarding that. Emily, you have any comment? Okay. Excuse me, to be clear, an economic hardship is not a true hardship. That's right. Thank you. But you will most likely hear it probably but you'll every hear it. time. Oh, absolutely. You'll hear it. But it's not, it's not a hardship upon which um, you can grant relief or should grant relief. So if someone says, we want to subdivide this lot and create two non-conforming lots because we want to build two houses and make more money, yeah, I mean, you have that one this evening. And by not allowing this creates an, a hardship, correct? That's right. So, you know, you have that, you have that this evening. Uh, and then if you examine what's taking place in that zoning district and whether or not that's creating an undue hardship by virtue of the fact that you're going to uh, reduce the minimum lot requirement for that zoning district is really what, what they're looking at. I, that's that's I, a question you have to look at. I'd like to, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but. Or am I, am uh, I overstepping my back? Well, one of the cases tonight, they're they're not creating non-conforming lots. Okay. So I just want to make sure that that's clear. And I think that Ms. Balcom was making a hypothetical statement perhaps, but um, this board could not allow something that creates non-conforming lots. So we would not bring something to you that for you to created. consider that would cause that. Mr. As far as lot size. Mr. Curry, I just wanted to say that virtually every case is going to have an economic effect. It's impossible to, to distinguish or to separate the, the fact that whatever we decide will have an economic effect one way or the other. So, yes, it can't be an economic hardship that is the basis for our decision, but, you know, economic benefit or hardship is always going to be a result. No, but the, I think the hardship is, is your ability to be able to uh, construct and use the property consistent with all the other people in the same zoning district. Right. And if you're not able to do that without the variance, then, then that, to me, that's an undue hardship. Right. Okay. Right. So that's... It may have an economic result. It may have an but, economic result. But it's still yeah. just a, a typical no. hardship. But it's not a hardship. It's not, you, you can say it's an economic hardship because I'm not going to make as much money, but that's not, that's not a, an undue hardship for purposes of what we're dealing with here. I think I'm trying to say that, that just because there may be an economic hardship doesn't eliminate the possibility that there are other hardships on which we can, can base it. That's right. 
and, and, and again, it really gets down to what's the, what's the property's owner's rights associated with the property that he's using and what he's asking for. Is that consistent with what's, what's taking place within that zoning dis district? You know, if the lot's irregular, whatever. I mean, if you don't do it, it's an undue hardship. Thus, in the seat of our pants, we're always looking at fairness. That's right. That's absolutely right. The last one is, is the requested variance would be consistent with the spirit and the purpose of this chapter and the city's comprehensive plan text. Um, well, as far as any report the staff is going to give you, they will tell you that it's consistent with the spirit and purpose of the chapter and the city's comprehensive plan. Otherwise, they would, you know, obviously recommend denial. Has there been any situation, staff, where we look at that issue? We really don't have a comprehensive plan because it's in adoption, but, you know, is this sort of a, a non-issue at this time for us? Well, we, we actually have the, the planning area plan from DeKalb County, so we have one, and so we're in the process of, of our own. Um, Typically, that's really more of a question relative to an actual zoning case versus a ZBA case. So we really don't run into that often with ZBA cases. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't anticipate that you would. Mr. Curry, uh, in a related matter, has the city council adopted the new uh, zoning maps? Are they now in effect? They are in effect. So would they affect tonight's cases, or would they affect only cases that are filed after the map is adopted? They would affect tonight's cases. Uh, um, uh, for me to say otherwise would say that we didn't have a good map to begin with, and I'm not going to say that. Well, but the map that was just adopted at the last council meeting has undergone right. some changes. So if we well, had an application that, on a property that had changed, I would think it would be subject to the old map. That's that right. Was, that was properly That's right. adopted, That's right. but not subject to That's the, right. the current map. Not right. subject I mean, to the current If there's a different zoning if there was designation a different zoning now, on that property. I would a, think it would be the new one, wouldn't you? Would you think it would be the new one? For tonight's case. But in any event, the staff okay. review and the staff report, um, we've included what's appropriate for the board to consider in that regard. If, if there is a concern, it would be about non-conforming or something that, anything along we're that looking line. At, is there, has there been any change? Yeah. It was an academic no, question. No, I, I don't think that there's any such case, but I just want to confirm mm -hmm. that the new map is in effect. And it is. It is. And is it on the website? Yes, it it's is. on the web and it's posted. But what Tom meant, and, for, and, and I'm, correct me if I'm wrong, Tom, about considering it under the old map, that would just be under questions of whether they had a right to do something that is non-conforming or not. Now the zoning has changed for everyone. Whether or not it was a non-conforming structure under the old map or under old versions of zoning is a different question that you probably, I don't think you have any of that tonight. Does that make Se sense? Seeing as how it's hypothetical, I think we can move on. But right. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. All right, um, <laughs> shall we move on to administrative appeals? Yes. Yeah. Okay, all right. All right, this is, this is the code section, 27912, power and duty of the board to hear appeals of decisions of administrative officials. And what's tantamount here is that if an administrative decision is made and um, that person wishes to object to that administrative decision, then uh, under the situation involving zoning matters, um, and it will also be expanded to um, tree ordinance when, when that gets adopted, um, and we're also in the process of doing cleanup in the zoning, um, the zoning code, which will also be moving along so we'll have some cleaning up but decisions that affect administrative matters or administrative decisions that affect zoning decisions have the first appeal to you all um, and it's different the, the type of appeal and the type of hearing is different than the conduct of 
the hearing on a variance or a special exception request. And uh, though we tend to and have in the past try to treat them the same way, um, uh, Ms. Preston and I are going to probably recommend some changes as far as these hearings take place. Uh, if, if they're going, they, you know, they may be a separate portion of, of the meeting. In other words, they'll be special right there for them and they won't be put in with the new business or whatever, whatever the case would be. And I think we also have to discuss as we go through here the procedures the board really wants to follow in connection with these hearings. Because as you see, um, you don't have to make a decision right away. You can deliberate. This is really, when you get down to, this is really a judicial function that you're doing. In other words, you're, you're looking at what's taking place. You're going to take a, a, a standard and determine whether or not the decision was wrong under the code or it was arbitrary and, um, and make that decision. And um, both the city and the uh, applicant or appellant have the opportunity to um, question that decision of the administrative board by appealing it to the Superior Court through a writ of certiorari. You all are familiar with that and, you know, dealt and, and, and unknowingly in the vacuum dealt with the debacle that that, that had created at the time. Um, <clears throat> all right, what, section. Were you referring to a particular case? No, I was just debacking <laughs> an observation. I call it a debacle. So, well, like, like the time we, you know we we were sitting there. Yeah, I mean, so. Well, like the pink pony uh, bathroom uh, dressing room expansion. That wasn't case. a debacle. That was, I know that, that was, was, but that was decided by us on this administrative right. basis. And then I, I noted that the city council of record made a public decision not to appeal. They debated. They discussed right. it. They decided not to appeal, which would have been their right. right. Where in the situation we were dealing with the issue at uh, 2802, where we were in a meeting uh, that was a special call meeting, the issue of the city also coming through and also doing its own writ of certiorari for the purpose of, of protecting its interest associated with that was done, and that that was the debacle that I was referring to because it was done without, you know, I mean, it just hit everybody upside of the head, and it, it was fast and it was quick and whatever. It was unfortunate um, because the city, in other words, the city can't appeal without the city council approving it. I mean, that's not not the authority of the city attorney to to go off half cock and file suit or do whatever. Can't do it. Or the director. <laughs> or the director. All right. <clears throat> the Zoning Board of Appeals shall have the power and duty to hear and decide appeals where it's alleged by the appellant that there's an error in any final order, requirement, or decision made by an administrative official based on or made in the enforcement of the zoning ordinance. A failure to act shall not be construed to be an order. Uh, requirement or decision within the meeting of this um, provision. Now, the other, the, the reason is, is if there is a failure to act, if somebody refuses um, to issue, if, if for whatever reason, you know, they fail to act, then there is what's called a mandamus action in which that can be made in, in the courts in order to force a public official to do what it's required to do. So you can't just sit on a no decision, but it takes a legal action to, to call to the question. To, to call the question. That's right, and, and force them to do what they're supposed to do. And sometimes it, um, what you know, what occurs is that if it's something that comes to you on a decision, and you make a decision, say affirming the finding of the administrative official, then the action that may come back along with the writ would also be the same type of action saying that the public official really shouldn't have done what they did and, and, and do that. But the fact that they don't act, they can't complain to you about it. So there's there nothing has to be in the an code action. that says, based upon an application for decision, the officials have X number of days to act and the failure to act constitutes a denial. There's nothing like that in the code. There are in some provisions, but that wouldn't be something that you would yeah. hear. 
let's say you applied let's say you applied for a building permit and maybe this is not a good example and they just sat on it all all licensing schemes have to have permitting timelines mm -hmm. and um, a building permit has 30 days and then if they don't act, you don't act within the 30 days what happens um it, it can stand to be approved Andy, okay mm -hmm. So my question is, if we hear an administrative appeal, which we're going to tonight, and we affirm the administrative decision, and it is taken to the Superior Court, are we going to be called out in the action, or will the city? You, you could be named as a party, but you would just be named as the, the, the judicial party of that your decision is being appealed. Or it's you're not. So you're Look, not individually named. You're not like individually being sued, but they'll they'll say the zoning board of appeals, and then they'll put the names of each person after that, which names who is the zoning board of appeals. So it's not as if there is a legal action being instituted against you personally. And it's a kind of a difference in practice. Some attorneys will just say zoning board of appeals, and some will actually name you individually. Same thing with the city council. Uh, but any time a variance is granted or denied and somebody appeals, you'll be named. And it's, but it's, either. it's technically Mr. X, board member X, right. in mm -hmm. his or her capacity as a member exactly. of the board only. Exactly. Right. So, Who provides the going back to the case with 2802 Ashford, mm -hmm. there were conversations after that uh, debacle, as you put it, uh, about whether or not the ZBA needed separate counsel. counsel. That's right. Where did that land? Because last I heard, we were supposed to have separate counsel that I believe you were going to choose, but then no, it was the um, it. it was the I know that the discussion was with the mayor, and if the ZBA, you know, concluded that there was separate counsel that was necessary, then um, I would still be here to represent the city. Right. Okay, I mean it, it was not it's not so I would still I would still be in that position and to represent the staff and represent the city and, and if the ZBA wanted to have separate counsel as far as um, running by legal opinions to them and not to the city attorney there's there's nothing that keeps that from I mean that's available but what you do expense. but what, what but you there's do there's an expense yeah and what you do typically is your role as the judiciary or the quasi judiciary depending on what role you're serving is is to file in a writ of, in these type of proceedings is to file the answer and the answer is the record that you guys looked at below and so the attorney would be helping you and typically the secretary or the um, clerk would prepare the answer you don't file motions per se you don't actively involve in the merits of the lawsuit now in DeKalb County um, the practice is that where you are sued, um, another attorney will answer that because it, it will answer that because it too is also having to to put in the ordinances and do whatever. In the case of 2802, it was another lawyer that actually answered on your behalf. It wasn't it wasn't me. Well, tonight's appeal is one where, as a judicial body that we are, most judges have law clerks right there are lawyers who do research mm -hmm. for them help them you know brainstorm their opinions give them advice whatever you know this this case without talking into the specifics of the case but this like many other cases that may come later are something that there very well could be an appeal either way no matter what we decide and it wouldn't necessarily be bad or good but we have to make a decision somebody's going to be aggrieved and have the right to appeal mm -hmm. so you know it does seem like a case where this might be one where we need special counsel appointed uh, to help advise us on on this case I mean this is a code a, co a code interpretation case true in and, and here you know and he and and in connection with the, with the, with the presentation of that case um, we will be we will be representing the city and the staff and the staff's decision and so, and so whether or not you know what we think is as far as what we think is the merits of the case is not an issue you're an advocate that's you're right. an advocate it's not sir. an issue so what's the procedure if we decide we want to consider special counsel what steps do we take to well first of all i think you you know 
the people that can appoint council is the mayor and approved by the city council as far as special counsel or whatever it is that any lawyer other than me or, or Bill Riley when he was in this position had similar appointments. If I, if I brought another attorney in from the outside when we were doing the zoning map and all those issues, actually they had an attorney that came in and that he was, his, his engagement was approved by the council. Um, and short of that, there's really no other way to do it unless you just, or we sit there and we go to the mayor and say, mayor, or go to the council. We want to be able to consult our own attorney and this is who we want and they concur with that, then fine. So we would have to defer the case and make an application to the mayor and city council that would be or, I mean, I mean, or, or as Corey says, I mean, this, this, this was discussed. I, you know, yeah. I know that Tim discussed it at one time. Mayors discussed it with me, and I said, fine. I said, if that's, uh, you know, if, if they feel that they, you know, have to have that, that representation. I mean, it's like, you know, the development authority has its own attorney. And, um, but you're right on these types of things and on these types of hearings, no matter what we think, we're, we're going to be advocating for the city. Right. Are we and currently covered as a board under any sort of director's and officer's liability policy? You're covered by um, immunity. Governmental under immunity. Governmental immunity. Okay. But... Don't you remember that when in the movies when they sit there and yell aren't governmental immunity but where you get shot right between the sure, eyes? Sure, sure. So um, aren't, there, aren't there, are there any limits though? I mean, isn't there an well, opportunity where you could abuse it and lose well, it? Well, if you're, you know, the, as you always hear, uh, the zoning lawyers getting up and they argue that if you don't find their way, you're being arbitrary and capricious. You know, I mean, which to me is uh, just calling you, just making, doing a dastardly deed. Um, to get to the point that if, if you were doing something that was outside of your authority, okay, I think you could be subject to that. If you had, if you had a personal bias and, and you just said, and you were arbitrary, I mean, being arbitrary is one thing, and then being capricious, I mean, it almost has to be some sort of malice to, you know, that, or complete disregard for what, what the, uh, ordinance says in order to get to that, but I think even at that point, the immunity is still going to protect you. And, and immunity doesn't afford no. defense costs like a typical public you, officer you would, liability you policy would, would. Yeah, you would not. Correct. Not, that is something that I have never seen. Never, <laughs> so, never seen I've what? Never seen a zoning board member get sued for damages. It would, it, they would always be suing the city for damages. Sure, but we, under a typical policy, we would be afforded defense costs. Well, and I'm sure the city would do the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just saying but, I'm, it, it's not something that happens, and it's not sure, saying that we sure. shouldn't look into it potentially, but it's not typical. Um, you could be sued. We say sued, but really it's an appeal. Sure. And I'd just like to add to that, I've never seen it happen in 32 years either. And, and, and in terms, for everything, right? In terms yeah. of getting appealed, I think you should be concerned about, obviously, doing what you think is right in terms of the ordinance, and what the advocates argue, but you could be appealed or sued for a variance grant or denial too. I mean, it's something that any case that there's always that possibility. So I wouldn't hang your hang your hat on it. Let's talk about the standard, Mr. Curry. Uh, All right. Well, let's go let's back move to on, move on to paragraph D. D. Yeah. What time is it? It's five twenty. Okay, so let's let's finish. We'll finish with this. Like all good lawyers, I don't wear a watch, so you never know how much time. I thought it was about eight o'clock, Chad. <laughs> I mean, no, okay, all right. If you go to the second um, sentence in paragraph D, the appeal shall be sustained only upon an expressed finding by the board that the administrative official's action was based on an erroneous finding of a material fact or that the administrative official acted in an arbitrary manner. Much okay. harder to prove the latter, isn't it? Well, uh, true, because if, frankly, if, if, there's, if there's an erroneous finding of a material fact on the part of the administrative official, 
that if that fine, in other words, you find that, that the facts are different, okay, based upon what was considered in connection with that decision, and that you find that those facts are actually something different, and had those facts, you know, were what you considered them to be, what you found as a as a fact finder, um, you sitting as a jury also, that um, then yes, that would you would say then if based on that, that was really the case, and that should have been what took place. And I think that's my phone. Sam calling to tell us he's on his way. Oh, that's Mary Jo Curry. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell her I did that. <laughs> um, but you know that's you know you're you are you are a fact finder, and if you find that the facts differ from what the decision was made on, then that's a, that's a basis upon um, seems like finding that, a reversal. Seems like that type of, and since it's an either or, right, we could overturn it based on either one. That's one that would seemingly jump out at you a little more. Would be a little more. Uh, clear and then the other saying that you've acted in an arbitrary manner well arbitrary to me would mean that it's the finding was in complete disregard of what really what the ordinance says or intends to say did you give us all the definitions in West or yeah in the law dictionary you know how they have no. several did you give us all you want you gave us one I remember one definition of on arbitrary. arbitrary right there may I, be others I think there might be another one, but I'm okay. not. But but I, I think it was not related to this. Oh, you wrote the brief, Wendy. <laughs> that that part. <laughs> but she will be arguing that case tonight. But and you know. obviously that 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 standard, you know, whenever you file any kind as a lawyer, whenever you file any motion for summary judgment, we we will argue a little bit about. What the standard well, what, means. What, what's, what else can be arbitrary? Well, the Supreme Court has, in general, big picture. They've said that zoning decisions are arbitrary. And keep in mind, this is my argument this evening, so please take it with a grain of salt. Um, but they are arbitrary if they do not bear a substantial relationship to the public health, safety, morality, or general welfare in terms of the zoning case. I know that's, that's a little archaic. That's the, the legal definition of arbitrary. Well, you quoted Black's Law Dictionary to say that arbitrary means founded on prejudice or preference rather than on reason or fact. Yes, that's what Black's Law says. So lack of reason. To me is that if you would look at, at what the decision was is that under the statute or citing even further as far as the public health and welfare that they're not going to make a decision that's going to hurt the public and nobody in their right mind would have come to that same conclusion in, in the terms of litigation for zoning cases I think it comes up mostly when people are alleging some type of unequal protection argument or that they were treated differently in one case than another case also um, that's something that you might hear arbitrary um, but that's not necessarily that's what the developers or the people coming in might argue. That well, just to we have don't another, have precedent. Another we don't have each precedent. Each case is unique. It's right. kind of difficult to be arbitrary. I was I just giving you the other yeah. other point I just of view. Think arbitrary is it's you know it's classic. Uh, don't confuse me with facts. I've made up my mind. Um, yeah, I mean that's just you know like you say, notwithstanding any other person would have found differently. Right. That you just you know it could be prejudicial. It could be. You could be hard-headed, but usually it gets back around. There's some reason, there's some prejudicial reason why the person's doing it. Prejudice they, or a reason. Just, or, or, or they're just uninformed. Yeah, the fact issue is, is the other side of the or, but in this case, founded on preference rather than, or prejudice rather than reason seems to be the most mm -hmm. code, you know, concise way to look at it. As I always say, when people, when we read these things and there's, you know, there's decisions made in subjectivity, we have 159 courthouses in our state by virtue of the fact that P 
people have differing opinions. Sure. Except for Hancock County. <laughs> What is no, Hancock County? Have? Well, they, they moved it. Burn, they, it burned, burned down. down. <laughs> okay. I think it's 5.30, so. Um, um, dive in. Would you like to have other topics to discuss in the future? Anything that jumps at you? Maybe a topic on official immunity and, <laughs> and <laughs> potential <laughs> liability. <laughs> I think that would be a worthwhile discussion to have. Because Agreed. Uh, again, with, with last time. Counsel. All right. Well, then we'll do that. We'll do that next month. You all will. When it comes time for the regular meeting, you can you can authorize that. And now we're going to go into the can works. We can I. We're in August now. Can I suggest we move that to October? Fine. Actually, that would work. That would work much better. Hmm? What if you get sued before? Yeah. So you can you can bring that far as at the time of the meeting. Now you're going to go into the work session and your chairman has resigned. So until you elect a new chairman, which you have the authority to do, but you can't do that in a work session, then um, Mr. Beardsley as the vice chairman will, will then assume uh, the chair of the work session. I'm prepared to call the meeting of the work session meeting of the zoning board appeals to order is that do i have any objections from the board nope. hearing none i call the august 20th meeting of the zoning board of appeals work session to order um, the first uh, order of business is a roll call uh, mr self present mr bolia present mr veers it's Byers. Byers. i'm here Glenn? Here. Fires. <laughs> Ms. Balkum? Present. And Jed Beardsley is present. So we have all five members present, clear, clear quorum. Um, we've had our training, I believe. So item three is organizational and procedural items. Madam Director? I'm going to let Ben handle both the work session and the hearing tonight. So he's going to talk to you a little bit about organizational and procedural items. Well, just as a reminder, in terms of the organizational and procedural items, as mentioned and as uh, provided in the agenda for the regular meeting, uh, just a, a reminder uh, is again for the nomination election of a chairperson for the remainder of the 2014 term. Um, I believe beyond that, there is no other items, Mr. Vice Chairman. Thank you. Okay. Um, so when it comes time, excuse me, when it comes time to elect a new chairman, what what do we do? Is it, there's I'll, I'll call for nominations from the floor. Okay. And right. Okay. Call for call for the nomination so for the chairman position. There's a cue there for us to do something. That's right, and then he'll he'll make the cue. And and the way I see it, we could have two not two nominations. I mean, we could have one nomination and then a motion to, you know, approve that that nomination, or we could have two nominations and then basically we're voting between A or B. <clears throat> Any anybody have see it any differently? We could have five nominations. No, that won't yeah, count. we could. <laughs> yeah, because there's no restriction on nominating yourself. Right. So it's uh, Mr. Unlikely. Self, that would be a debacle. That would be a yeah. debacle. <laughs> I agree. And that's also <laughs> unlikely. Um, okay, so then if there's no, well, would would unfinished business in the regular meeting be part of unfinished business in the work session? So do we need to talk about ZBA cases 30, 38, 46, and 47? Yes, yes sir. Okay, let's do that, and particularly if you could point out any new information that's been delivered or received. Sure, I'll be more than happy to. Um, so ZBA 1430, if you recall, it was re uh, deferred for 60 days. Um, it was a request to reduce the lot width for an R100 uh, zone lot from 100 feet to 90 feet. Uh, the request, in essence, was to create two lots, uh, of which currently it's, it's a single lot. 
Um, I believe uh, board members self mentioned or requested the applicant to provide uh, a revised site plan, sort of it, providing a little bit more information related to how it would be impacted if the average setback was to be included and applied. Um, and if you recall from the email that I sent out today, unfortunately this came to staff late yesterday afternoon. Uh, we haven't had enough time to be, uh, in all honesty, to uh, review it uh, thoroughly to provide sort of a, a staff's perspective. Um, what I can mention to you right now is it's still lacking some information that we would need uh, to provide uh, a correct synopsis of the revised site plan to the board. Um, what I mean by that is, and could you? Ben, if I may interrupt. Yes. Do we have a copy of that site plan here? Uh, it's you page. It, yeah, we emailed it. I, I don't have actual I know hard emailed, copies. I yeah. know so is it not this one? one? Yeah, I don't have a printed one. Oh, that's oh what no, they that's, that's the old one. Ago. Oh, there's a new one? Email. Is it in the computer? This is the what we received okay. electronically and, well, hard copy yesterday. I see the adjustment being the front setback on the left house more to an average. Well, the thing is they, they call out an average here. They call it an average of 75.42 feet, if I'm correct. Um, but they haven't correctly sort of delineated um, the average setback to the individual lots. It's sort of, they're just doing an angle from one corner of right. uh, the property to the west and to the other corner of the property to the east. So in essence, if I, when I was measuring it out and scaling it, it's not correctly representing the average setback. In addition to that, uh, we would have preferred, in terms of the sp staff's perspective, for them to provide us the actual uh, measurement of the lot width based upon the average setback. And, and if I could add, if you don't mind, Ben, uh, we really have not had enough time to review the revised plan. You all haven't had enough time to look at it either. So there may be other things that we're not sharing with you right now because we haven't had time to review it. So you're recommending deferral? Yeah, they're, re they're requesting the law. Well, I mean, as the board, you have They're the, not. I am. Well, <laughs> you have the ability to move forward which, uh, with a motion of uh, deferral, approval, denial. Um, well, you know, but like I said, in terms of staff's there, perspective, there are we are other not. Issues in this case, that relate to uh, uh, have they have they properly told us about any floodplain issues? I mean, this lot on the right is way down in a hole. Yeah, right? so yeah. I mean, like like we uh, sort of alluded to last time. Um, Initially, the home itself, as it currently stands, is situated farther back onto the property, but I believe it was to account for exactly, I can't necessarily say if there was, a, if there's a creek or if there's some type of body of water that would impact uh, development on the lot, um, but again, it's not represented on the site plan, and I believe that was another issue that was uh, brought up to the applicant uh, during the last meeting. Completely redrawn the layout of the houses. And they're not pushing the side mm -hmm. setback envelope, so they could set them back even further if they had to. So that doesn't appear to be a limitation. To me, it's the part that we don't know. Well, the things we don't know that. Yeah. Well, you got to keep in mind the request is for a lot width, right? And one thing that gets a little complicated. And I don't necessarily want to complicate the matter further, but per the ordinance, when it talks about lot width, lot width is supposed to be measured at the street frontage, the the right of way adjoining the pro uh, the property. In addition to that, the lot width is also uh, has to be ha or measured at the point of the required setback line, the front yard. Per the ordinance, it's, it's not very clear. It's, all it says is required front yard setback. In this case, it could be either or, depending on the situation, which one is built first and so forth, because if the average setback doesn't apply, then that's when only the district requirement would apply, and the dis district requirement in that case would be 35 feet. Yeah, we shouldn't let them play the game of, well, we want to well, build sure. one first so that we can push sure. the other. You know. But it's just a consideration for you all to, to, for the board to understand. Mm -hmm. And in addition to that, and then once you factor in the uh, average front yard setback, it does change. Are so, we allowed to make a condition if we approve this that, you know, we just say that, that you'd have to use the average setback of those two houses on either side? Could we make that a condition or is Yeah, that that's it's definitely... Anything could be placed under condition uh, based upon if you were to move what, as a collective group for approval. But. but you would have to make sure that the lot width does not fall below 
the what has been advertised. Right. So the main thing here is they advertise to reduce it to 90. Any other request that is uh, greater than, of a reduction than 90 feet from 100 to 90, that essentially would require them for to, to resubmit. Yeah. Um, and as, as I recall, Ben, that's why we deferred this was because they're asking for 90, but they hadn't shown us where the average setback would be or if it would apply. Correct. And we didn't know that it would be 90. Correct. Right? We weren't so. sure, just we didn't have the information. And even now with the revised site plan, uh, we still don't have that clarity that we were seeking. Yeah. Isn't there a deadline by which they're su supposed to submit documentation well, after the meeting? Per the rules and procedures, there isn't anything specific per uh, cases that are unrelated to an administrative appeal. Mm -hmm. um, but in this case, generally speaking, what the board generally tended to do was say, hey, you know, at least two weeks in advance right. of the, I believe, the posting of the agenda. And I'm guessing um, we didn't do that with this one. Got it today. Well, you got it this morning. So <laughs> there right, you go. Right, but did we, did we say we needed it earlier and they just provided it this morning, or did we not even set it? I don't believe for this case it was specified. Okay. Okay, but. Um, we, I had talks with the applicant uh, asking them to provide it earlier or sooner, um, but it, again, it came yesterday afternoon. Okay. Okay. All right, moving on. Uh, ZBA 1438. It was deferred from last month uh, per the request of the applicant for the uh, standalone ATM kiosk at the uh, former Harris Theater. Uh, shopping center. They did provide a revised elevation, a revised site plan, and also a revised letter of intent. If you recall from the staff report, the initial application uh, requested for a variance to elimination of the second story requirement of the overlay. That was the only request that was made by the applicant. Staff did state in the report that they were lacking a variance to the building elevate or the building materials applicable to the overlay as well as the setback requirement um, associated with buildings or primary buildings uh, within the overlay, which is uh, no greater than 20 feet. Uh, with that said, the revised letter of, uh, they did submit a revised uh, building elevation where they show that the ATM kiosk could uh, comply with the requirements of the overlay, which showing that it would be fully <coughs> brick. And Drew, if you could bring that up. Where, what, where are you looking now for this informa new information? Is this on ZBA packet 79? Let me see. What page? What page, Joe? <coughs> Let me get there. Uh, 49? No, it's actually uh, page. 57? Mm. Yeah, 57. Yeah. Okay, you got 57. Yeah. Ah, yes. And it's also up on the screen. So initially, I believe it was all stucco that they were uh, requesting, uh, which is not a permitted building material. Uh, the revised elevation would show that it would be primarily brick, which is uh, compliant. But if you look at the actual letter of intent, the revised letter of intent, which begins on page 53, the, they requested that an additional variance be considered, uh, which is for the actual setback requirement, because they're exceeding 20 feet from the front property line. But with that said, if you recall, this is a deferral from an actual application requesting a single variance. All right. In order for them to tack on an additional variance, they would have to go through the process all over again. Um, and with that said, even with if that was part of the consideration, staff would still proceed with our initial recommendation of denial. So have they moved the location, or are they just asking for a variance asking to the same variance. location? They're asking for the, uh, the same location. They're referencing the same distance requirement, of, uh, what we reference in our staff report of being set back 48.2 feet. What um, Drew, could you bring out the revised site plan? What page is it that they're asking for the additional variance? 53. How can we grant an additional variance if they haven't gone through the process? We can't. We can't. Right. I just wanted to. Bring, okay. Yeah. It's just more for just to bring it up that they did represent or sort of request that through the letter of intent, but unfortunately we can't move forward with that request. 
Uh, the legal ad has gone out. The sign posting has been on the property advertising a single variance. We've been we've been criticized, shall I say, for trying to help people who made procedural mistakes in their application and kind of demonstrate forgiveness. Uh, you know, what's your feeling of what's your administrative recommendation as staff as to how we deal with basically errors in, in the application and trying to ask for something that we can't grant. Well, obviously you can't grant it, but I mean their choice is to we rat rule on what they've applied for, which is incomplete, or or we you know make it clear to them and then they stand there and withdraw. Well, to be honest with you, um, I mean they could request by their own admission to. Um, request a withdrawal without prejudice based upon the discussion that takes place as part of the public hearing. Uh, but you always have the, technically you as the board would have to deal based upon the request that's been made before you. But we have to tell them we don't have the power to grant you the second variance. Sure, sure. They yeah. can't build it without that second variance. Anyway. They can't build it there. Yeah. They can put it on the other side of the park. Right. Yeah. But in either case, it would require them going through the entire process all over again just because again the legal procedures that we have followed in terms of what we have put out in terms of the legal ad in terms of and the way in which the board sort of goes about uh, reviewing cases typically it's associated with an approval uh, condition to a site plan as well so okay so we don't have a site plan to condition the approval of the one variance Unfortunately, it's a compliance site right, plan. Right, a compliance site plan. Right now, they're still in the same location. They just wanted to add that additional tack on that additional variance. You guys with? You guys follow that? Yep. You know, I mean, they did make a, a, an effort in terms of providing a crosswalk leading from the sidewalk to the ATM uh, kiosk, but in either case, they were still required to apply for additional variance. Uh, but they don't have to wait two years or a year or something to do it, they can add it's another variance. Denied. Unless, they're, unless denied. they're denied. Right. If we approve this variance and they don't have enough, they can come back and apply for the second variance. Well, if you, essentially if you approve this, then by uh, sort of a de facto approval of the, the second variance. That no, no, no. We need What's to the second variance? Uh, the to be further away from the street than they're allowed to be. They're al they have to be within 20 feet from the right-of-way, is that right? Fine. Yeah, but what I'm saying is this. At this point, it's based upon sort of a site plan and the general procedures. And again, it, this is just based upon Normal previous procedure. actions that have taken right. place. It's always been conditioned to a specific site plan so that you know exactly what you're dealing with. A compliance. And exactly what you... A, com a exactly. site plan with which we agree is otherwise compliant. Right. So... Where they, can you tell me where they're trying to move it to? They're not trying, they're to, not move trying to move it. Oh, it's it the it same location. The <laughs> it's it's far, too far from the street to be compliant. And what Ben is saying is if we gave them the variance to just build it, they couldn't build it where this site plan says. They'd have to build it close to the street, but we don't have the condition gotcha. of our variance to say, you know, we approve it subject to site plan. So, sure. I mean, we could approve it, and then they'd have to come back and ask for a permit wouldn't you have to? Yes, they would have to comply with the requirements at that time. So it's not fatal. It's not fatal, uh, but for the most part, if you approve something with a, an approved condition, you just know what you're going to be ending up with out on site. Well, didn't staff recommend approval, though? No, we staff recommended recommend denial. Changed your recommendation. Although the, re the, the recommendation has stayed the same, which has been denial from the beginning. Okay. Thank you. Let's move on. Anybody right. else want to belabor that one? Yeah. If you don't mind, if I could combine 46 and 47. Yep. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Good. All right. So 46 and 47, um, as you recall, there was a lot of uh, change in terms of the property and the builders associated with the property. We understand that there's always been a single owner, but he has had several uh, builders, architects that were involved in the design aspect of the home. And I believe uh, board member self task staff to uh, obtain the original building uh, site plan, which I believe I have. And Drew, if you could come up with the uh, the original building site plan. You could start is with it, the Is it in our packet? Yes, it is. 
And let me check the page number on that. There's two of them, I suppose. The first one. Page 72. 72 was stamped June 6th. 75. 75 would be the first one, which is the uh, site plan that's on the screen up there My for you. The page doesn't have a 75. Is it this one? It's, just hard, small, to, it's hard to read the number. It's much that's smaller. Right now. Yeah. This here, John. Oh, John, very small. Okay. Yeah. I need magnifying glasses. Definitely harder to see. Um, is there a date on this? It says G101. The drawing is G101. Is that? Yeah. What I'll say is this. the uh, If you recall, the both the applicant as well as the next door neighbors, uh, Stott and uh, Barbara Wachowski, I believe that's her last name. Um, they mentioned that uh, Richard Rakusin was the original architect. And this is actually um, a copy of the site plan that I received from a planner uh, that was in charge of reviewing this initially. Um, and I've also confirmed, because after that meeting I had a discussion with uh, the adjacent neighbor, and I showed them the actual permits that I had in my possession or the site plan, and I've confirmed with them that this is the exact site plan that they uh, that they're familiar with as well. Saying this site plan, you're talking about the original one. The original that's up page on the screen. Page 75, the one page that's 75. dated March 4th or whatever, 2013. Yes. Clearly compliant with the seven and a half foot side setback with no bump outs. Well, there is an overhang feature. If you look to the north, to there the is north. there's a slight bump out on north is to the bottom of the page. Hold on, let me. Just, oh, sorry, I apologize. To the uh, west. So that's to the left of the page. To the right of the or page. To the right. The west. It looks like a like a window or something. No, the right of the page <laughs> is on this one. Yeah, yeah. These are mirror Im It's a mirror image with the. Uh, yeah, if you're comparing about? the two, you've got to flip one of them around because yeah. they're hey, printed go. opposite. Right there. Flip it the other way, like you had it. So the west, the west side is on this, the right hand side of the page. That's correct on oh. page 75, and right. so the only bump out there is is almost like a window overhang. Right yeah, there. right. That's not what they built. They built an okay. entire room okay. that bumps out. Yes, I mean it's it's different. It's different from the original, okay? Um, and in both cases, both for 41, 1041 and 1045, uh, in both, ca both cases, it's slightly modified from what the original site plan showed. Modified to go into the setback. Yes. So with that said. And what does it currently sit at now on the side setback? I mean, on the, yeah, how, how far does it go into the? Three feet. On 1041, the closest encroachment would be 5.45 feet okay. for the property line. Two feet. Two feet. And, and then, change. yeah, and then for 47, which is 1045, it's 4.91 feet. 2.6 feet. Okay. And the, the approved plan did not encroach beyond the seven and a half feet? Is that slight, right? There's a slight bump out. If you look, I mean, that, I'm how seeing far the build line here. I'm like seeing, okay, so just that just little that piece. At most, yeah. just okay. at most maybe like a, oh, at most window, maybe a right. frame maybe sticking a foot. out. Maybe a foot at most. Okay. Uh, at most. There are mirror images on the two. Yeah. This was the approved plan they got from this the Cab County. Actually, yeah, through so us. Just it's that here. Yes. It's there. It's in this one, it's here. And on this one, it's there. But mind you, this one, we've got this whole wall that comes out. So I've flipped mine around. That's the current This is their current drawing. Yeah. They've got a whole wall that comes out room. here. Okay. So the builder thought it only mattered what the hangover was at the ground level, the, Where, yeah, the yeah. foundation. So, so this is their current drawing. That the one this on is 72? what was approved. Right. The bump out on the west side here is just this tiny little piece. 72. Right. Your, yeah. your seven and a half. That's just one It's right just here. that tiny little uh, bump That's out. That's what they actually right. looks like. Here's what 72 is as built, right? On here, that bump out doesn't exist. But instead, they bumped out this whole wall over here beyond the build line. The build line goes right down there, and they've bumped out to here, it looks like. So you can see what they just did. They just so this, they took this, and they just kept going. 
So they're even showing, let's see, they're showing 5.49 as their clearance on this one, but they're okay. showing 7.55 and they're approved. Right, okay, and this is, this is the other home that they own. They're building 1045. Is that right, Ben? 1045 is the other one? Yes, yeah. 1041, yeah. 1045. So the, I mean, not to say, but I mean, that's, that's his house. This is his house. He's encroached in the setback with a property that he owns. I'm not forgiving that. But they also that increased the front yard setback or decreased the front yard setback is, in the, from is, the original plan to what they did. And it's hard to read the numbers on yeah, this thing. The original plan is actually, um, they're showing 30. Uh huh. So for 41, um, they're more showing it correctly. Okay. Encroachment. So the 45 was the one where they had sort of the skewed a foundation right. layout well, okay. uh, where they're I'm encroaching three feet you, into that 30. All right, that can you slow down a yeah. second? Yeah. So did they build, yeah. if we're just what talking about 41, so. did they build the front, build it to the proper front building line as shown on the original site plan? Well, or? I'll tell you this, because remember we, we had a discussion in terms of the interpretation of the average setback and the application of it and how it should be applied and how to go about calculating the average setback meaning measuring from the side property line 75 feet. Unfortunately, that was not done when this originally came into the city. That interpretation, again, is not a change in interpretation. It's a correct in interpretation from our end in terms of applying it correctly. But with that said, for 1041, the front yard setback of the original site plan shows a setback 30 feet. The 1041 as built shows the foundation of the property showing at 30 feet. So those are shown, you know, I guess you, you could say compliant to the original site plan. Okay, right. but it turns out that now they, they, it would be 36 feet under the new inter. So they built yes. the front to the plan. Correct. And the front setback interpretation changed. Correct. So it's a little harder to punish them for that. Correct. Okay. But they, they just didn't build on the side setbacks to the plan. Now, sure. um, is... Do, are they asking for a variance on both sides of the house or just one side? Hey, we had the discussion too. It's actually for both sides. What staff did was account for the, the greatest encroachment related to a side yard. They are encroaching on both sides. Are they bumped out on both sides or is it? They are bumped out on both sides. I guess I'm not seeing the encroachment on what would be the east side. On 41? Hold on. Sorry, I'm looking at the, uh, the permitted plan. Well, you okay. know, the, yeah. the permit and the one in the th original plan are upside down, too. Yeah. The street's right. on the other side. So. I'm with you, then. But it's hard to see that. Is that measurement 8 point? I'm looking at 41, the as-built. Yes. It's 8.38 on one side, 8.3, looks mm -hmm. like. Mm -hmm. That is but correct. It says from the overhang is 6. Right, what they're doing is they're giving you two measurements. One from the foundation is 8.3. Right. The other is from the measurement of the overhang, which is 6.8. Okay. And then we're saying the overhang is just as much of an encroachment as anything. But this is the other discussion that we had. Overhang against cantilever cantilevering of the, the actual heated space. Right, it's one thing to put a, a soffit or a gutter. A roof overhang. Out. Right. In this case, it's beyond the roof overhang. Sure. Okay. Um, but again, I can't necessarily talk uh, to the original site plan of what they were trying to represent, where they're trying to represent just the foundation, or is it an actual correct assessment of what they were going to put out on the, uh, in terms of the, the completed house? That I can't necessarily confirm, but w one thing that I did confirm is this is the original site plan. Okay. But with that said... What about actual building plans? Did they have to submit building plans for over of getting a permit? Uh, I'll tell you this much. Uh, if my understanding is correct, when I initially came on board with the city, I don't think that was a requirement for a residential single-family detached building permit for someone to provide, for the applicant to provide a building elevations. Okay. okay. I believe that was all sort of handled out on the field. Didn't we also ask these applicants to work with their neighbors and try to talk to them and try to come to some? We and did, and we got in the packet where one of the neighbors. And that's neighbors what I was going to get to next is the letter that was provided by the adjacent neighbor 
Doug Stott. In essence, the Stott, uh, the Stotts or uh, the, the adjacent neighbor is in agreement to proceed with, they would like to recommend the approval of the applicant's request uh, in conjunction uh, to an approval being conditioned to provide some type of water quality measure, uh, in this case, some type of water flow, or sorry, uh, flow well system to capture uh, stormwater runoff associated with those two individual properties. And Ben, can you remind me, are they at 1037 or 1049? They are 1037. Have we heard anything from the neighbors at 1049? 1049, in essence, they're in agreement with the 1037 uh, neighbor as well. They just would like for some certain measures to be put into place to account for stormwater runoff okay. for both 1045 and 1041. Is, is the way that Mr. Stott described that condition that we condition on water quality control pits or catchment pits, is that then it out? I mean, what's the best way to state that if we made that a condition? Technically, what is the appropriate runoff? Um, <clears throat> Excuse me. I would say um, a condition that would state uh, installation of um, stormwater storage facilities with the capacity to receive um, 1.2 inches of runoff to be discharged through evaporation, transpiration, or infiltration, or um, to facilitate discharge through those measures. That's more than I could write down at one time, but uh, I heard an installation of stormwater storage facilities to receive 1.2 inches of runoff and dispose through what? Um, um, designed in a manner to facilitate um, discharge of the stored uh, volume through evaporation, transpiration, or infiltration. Trans, trans what? Transportation. Transportation or infiltration. Trans, transpiration. Transpiration? Yeah. Or infiltration. Yeah. Or evaporation. What is transpiration? transpiration. Up, uptake by plants. Okay. <clears throat> the intent there would be that the facility would be designed in a way that it would receive that volume of runoff from the impervious surfaces, and actually that should be added in there. That is a uh, stormwater storage facility designed to receive runoff equivalent to 1.2 inches of runoff from the impervious surfaces. Um, I'd add that in there. Um, but designed in a way that would simply facilitate discharge in that manner. That is, it'd be captured and would be structured in a way that um, uh, some of that discharge would occur in that manner. Bennett, let me ask. We suppose we grant this tonight and we make that stipulation, that condition, and we say uh, transferation, is that right? Yeah, yes. So the builder goes in and he, he puts in the appropriate plants to absorb the water. He sells the home and the homeowner comes in and says, I don't like these plants and I want more space to let my kids run and rips the plants out, right? It's conceivable that could happen, um, but... Um, it takes more than a plan. Doesn't it take some sort of facility, a basin, to collect the water? Well, the typical installation is simply um, not much more complicated than installing a, uh, people call it a pit. You excavate an area, in, in, the, uh, in this case, it would be in the backyard. The flow well. Uh, flow well installation Similar. would be a yeah. common installation. Um, the, probably the greatest, the, the, of those three options, the greatest magnitude of discharge would be through infiltration in the soil provided the soil has the percolation rate to receive it. Um, if it fills up and um, can't, you know, can't receive any more volume, there'd simply be runoff as there normally would be. Um, plants planted above the facility um, would provide some measure of relief for the stored volume, but you wouldn't expect that plants are going to be uptaking or, you know, discharging that runoff in a manner that's going to mitigate the impacts of a, of a uh, rain event that's underway. Um, if it was configured in a 
form of a rain garden or something like that, then plants would help um, with the discharge of the volume stored in the rain garden, for instance. <clears throat> so it, it's not that the discharge would have to occur by all three measures, but simply that the design is of a type that would facilitate or I might say encourage discharge of at least a portion of the volume in that manner. It wouldn't be a concrete vault that's just going to sit there and hold water forever. All right. Could you also just use a rain barrel? Rain barrel uh, is not part of what we would recommend as a condition, although it would not be frowned upon. The People rain barrels generally don't, they don't have the capacity that would provide a significant amount of mitigation when you get those uh, okay. major storm events they that are fairly common in the, in the summer. So but you'd have to have the rain barrel on top of one of these pits, I guess. And rain barrels are generally going to be placed adjacent to the house at the downspout, although if somebody is going to a more elaborate system, it certainly could be in the form of a cistern or something like that. <clears throat> Does the board feel the need to uh, go a little bit more extensive on uh, 1045? Nope. Okay. All right. So if we can move on to new business, I believe the first case is the appeal. Emily, I don't know if you have anything that you would like to share in terms of work session. I'm, I'm just going to decline because Mr. Dillard's not here. Okay. So we'll move on to... Uh, I think we need to come back to that, though, because we probably need to go over the procedure that will be used. Um, Emily, would you like for me to locate Mr. Curry? I, I'd be happy to talk about the procedure. I okay. I didn't want to talk about the merits. Um, Emily, just to clarify, you're saying Mr. Dillard or Mr. Curry is not present? Mr. Dillard. Okay. Because... I was referring to, to Mr. Curry. I thought Emily was waiting for Mr. Curry. She's saying Mr. Dillard. So okay. Let's stick to procedure. Correct. It's, it's going to be a little bit different than your normal procedures, and it's Section 17B. I don't know if you guys have a, a copy readily available. Um, but each party will have 10 minutes to present their argument with the unused side being used for rebuttal. So that, that is similar to a normal zoning decision. The order is a little different. Um, the order of the presentation at the hearing will be first persons other than the parties, and the parties are the city and the applicant or the appellant. Um, so you'll allow them to speak in favor of the appeal or against the appeal for three so minutes each. Ten minutes in favor, ten minutes against? Okay. They have, there. I don't believe there's a time limitation on theirs, but on our presentations there are the ten minute time limitations. Non-parties go first, separate into two camps? Mm-hmm. Okay. Just like a normal. Is there one that should go first, a for or against? In favor is first, and then against, and they're limited to three minutes each. In favor of the appeal? Yes. Um, if there happens to be anybody, there, there may be, in favor or against. Um, and then the appellant will go, and the appellant has 10 minutes. Sorry, um, three minutes each for the non-party? Yes. And then the appellant will go. That's the dealer. Which is the applicant, and he'll have 10 minutes then um, with the ability to reserve for bottle time. Then the city will present for 10 minutes, um, and then any other person with interest, but I don't believe we've had anybody file a notice of appearance in this case. So, I'm not sure if I do follow, but. Why do the non-parties speak first? Oh, hold, on, hold on. That's what the code says? She's asking for a minute to. There's 17B, did you find it? I have 17B, yes. Can I peek at it? Thanks. Uh, so, so Mr. Byers raises an excellent question. Why do the non-parties go first? And then to follow that up, if I can, we've seen some um, emails regarding this case already. I expect there will be a number of people who will want to speak um, that are not a party to it, but just neighborhood residents. Do, does each person get three minutes or each That's side gets three minutes? Each person gets three minutes okay. unless, um, unless they're speaking as, as the applicant or his agent. Okay. Do, do we have the authority to change the rules? You do, and we, we have been contemplating changing the rules because this is a little unusual to allow public participation in an appeal. Yeah. So maybe limit the public comment portion? No. 
instead of giving everyone three minutes uh, could accumulate into if a we have time. the right if we have the entire neighborhood come out and they all get three minutes to speak that's um late night well you're certainly entitled to put a 10 10 minute limit on it if, if you so desire or 20 we would, or we would just need to amend the agenda to do that at the beginning of the the, the we session need a motion to limit non parties to 10 minutes total yes and I, and I guess that could be based upon taking account how many people would like to speak on, you know, in favor or in, or in opposition, you could say. Oh, but it sounds like we need to do this at the start of the meeting before we ever get to this case, if we're going to amend the rules. Procedural items? Yeah. Yes, it would be at the very beginning during procedure. Yeah, so you would really need to make assess. a motion to amend. We can't really assess, okay, how many people would like to speak. We're going to limit it to... 10 minutes, 15 minutes, whatever. Mm -hmm. right. And you have the authority to take out that part completely if you wanted to at this point or limit it. You I, just I certainly need to, don't want to do that. I'd like to hear from the public. You just uh, need to make sure that you vote on it through a motion at the beginning of the hearing to change the okay. rules and procedures. And, and should we vote on that um, and change and say we want to limit it to 10 minutes and then we get to that case and the comments are... are coming in and people are using the 10 minutes and there's still a lot of people that want to talk can we at that point extend that time I, I believe that that you have the extend. authority okay. similar to it's it's similar to what you do for your um, variance for cases public for okay. public comment All right. but just keep in mind that the applicant won't go until after that is finished and then the city and then the applicant can reserve time for rebuttal and then the last person that would go would be a person of interest which typically could be a neighbor and Ben we have have we received any filings from people saying that they are persons of interest no not not officially so how is the person of interest different from public comment I would think the neighbor would get up during public comment it's they, they were required to give the city notice seven days before um, the appeal that they they wanted to speak during okay. that time. Okay, so we won't have any of that no. then based on. Okay. No. no. So, and I'm sorry I wasn't here, but I assume what we're saying is that we want to limit the public comment to ten minutes instead of three minutes per person. Three minutes per person, ten total. Ten total. Okay. Right. Both. What? Both three minutes per person with a cap of ten. But Not what 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 person. the procedures say are is that you've got three minutes per person with no limitation. Okay. We're just adding a ten minute cap per person. No total. Mm -hmm. Total. Okay. For each you side, know, for and against, ten minutes. And, oh, and no, we're just really talking about the appeal right now. Not all the other cases. Yes, yes. just the appeal. Yes. I don't know if I'm really comfortable like adding a ten minute problem. cap though. What about like twenty? When, when it's public comment, because I think, you know, the public. Anybody who gets up and stand, stands here and talks to us during public comment is going to be directly impacted. Yeah. Otherwise, they're not going to waste their time to come out to a meeting and get I'm up and talk to us. I'm not saying we have to limit it. If you but I don't know that I want to limit it to 10 minutes. I don't know that I want to leave it wide open where right. you know, 30 people show up and they each get three minutes. Uh, just one item to consider. If you had a chance to look at one, of the, one email that came through, and I don't know what other emails that you may have received individually, um, generally speaking, I think there are it, it, their sort of objection, you could say, um, for the most part, is related to a feature of if that site was to be developed as a restaurant more than it's associated with the actual appeal. Right. Right. Um, yep. So again, just to just to put that into perspective, I think we need to be clear at the beginning of the case as to what we're actually hearing because there will be a lot of people here thinking that we're yeah. going to be making a decision about whether or not a restaurant's <coughs> going in and that's not the case. Yeah, because that's part of a secondary fee, uh, process if, you know, if it was to go through a certain um, result, if it was to end in a certain specific result here from the board, then that would be a secondary sort of aspect of the process that would apply to that property. But where would that aspect take place? Well, I mean, Here. well, that would go before the planning commission, right. correct? Correct. Or if it's rezoning. a rezoning matter, then yes, it would be going before planning commission and city council. But if it's if it's a matter that they want the condition changed, and you find for if you find for the applicant, then they can go straight to city council. That's the only place they can go to. They can go. The uh, it's it's still planning commission and council. They, they would have to go through the actual rezoning process in terms of the changing conditions as uh, 
per our ordinance. Okay. And if that concludes 48, I think we can move on to the next cases. Well, That's all right with the board. Actually, if we can stop for a second. So, so if we were to affirm the appeal, say the they would then have to go to the planning commission. No, they wouldn't. No, no. The appeal is over and a rejected application. If you affirm the appeal, then they would have to then meet the city, what the city is arguing is the requirements for the application. If you denied it, then it, we, it would go to the planning commission. Okay. Well, when I say affirm, right. they're, they're appealing. You affirm so. their position, then they would, it would just, the application would proceed. You affirm the appellant's position. In other words, you reverse you reverse the administrative decision. Right. Okay. But if we affirm the administrative if decision. If you affirm the city's position, then the city um, would just require that they meet the the additional requirements that they're asking. That. Okay. Right. They would have to their 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 Okay, petition. so if I if I disagreed with the city's position, ruled with the applicant or with the, with the appellant. What then happens procedurally for them? What is what what is their next step? I, uh, perhaps the city well, appeals. If, what kind if, of if would it make? would be, but the city council would have to approve that. Okay. Um, the if if you if you hold in favor of them, then their application would go forward. Okay, and that would then require a rezoning, so they would have to go to the planning commission. What I understood was they were just asking for the condition to be waived. Is that not true? Well, a change of conditions requires the entire process, a, a rezoning to change conditions. So it would go through the Planning Commission and the City Council. Right. Because that's in all which, they're asking for. They're not asking for a change in zoning. They're asking for a change in, in condition. But that's different than what you just said, isn't it? No. no. This is it. It, it, the matter in which they're actually changing the conditions from was based upon an actual rezoning that took place in 2006 through DeKalb County. Right. No, which was that. basically that everything will look like the Woodley Right. Project. And then that's the process that they took in terms of the rezoning process of Planning Commission and their Board of Commissioners there. And in order to effectively change the conditions that were part of a uh, conditional approval of that rezoning, uh, they would have to go through that same, I guess you would consider a legislative process on our end, which would be this identical to a rezoning application. Although the zoning would not change, it's the, it's the conditions related to that specific zoning that would have to follow that same procedure. And, and we're, the whole appeal tonight is about whether they met the application requirements so to start me, that process. Let me see if I can summarize it. If we vote, if we rule in favor of the developer, then the developer's application as originally submitted without the approval of the other neighboring landowners can proceed. If we vote in favor of the city, then they can still make an application, but it would have to meet the standards that Ben felt it did not meet and get the approval of the other landowners to, to file an appropriate zoning application. That's correct. That's correct. So we... By voting to uphold the city's decision, we are not taking away their right to file an application. Absolutely not. That's correct. Okay, thank you. Just, just this application. Mm -hmm. So, if you were making a motion, the motion would be either to, how would you? It would be a motion to deny their appeal, affirm or deny the appeal. You, you, right. Yeah, it would be affirm, affirm the administrative decision, or deny the administrative decision. Okay. You could say. If the board is satisfied, we can move on to 49, unless you have any other questions. I say we move on. Okay. So I'll try to go as quickly as possible, considering the time that we have left. Uh, ZBA 1449, um, it's a request to reduce the side yard setback from 7.5 feet to 3 feet uh, for a proposed addition and carport. Which page are we on? Uh, 241. 242. Thank you. The 242, sir. Okay. Okay. Um, so with that said, 
again, the from the letter of intent, if you had a chance to review the letter of intent and, and if you were to compare it with the site plan that's up on the screen, uh, the applicant wasn't very, they did mention that they would like to expand uh, the property and to include a carport and an addition, a living space addition, uh, but they weren't very clear in terms of where that distinction would be between a carport and the extension of the home. Uh, when staff made a site visit, we felt that a carport would be maybe appropriate in the fact that a carport is technically unenclosed. It, it would have a roof over it. Uh, but in terms of the living area, it would be a full enclosurement uh, and be an extension of the existing home. But with that said, if, you were to, if we were to proceed with the allowing the addition uh, separate from the carport, it may pose, staff felt, uh, some safety emergency concerns uh, that be associated with accessing those portions of the property considering that each lot uh, adjacent to it is fairly in close proximity to, of each other. Uh, so with that said, uh, staff has recommended that the board deny uh, the request, or deny the variances as requested, but substitute in lieu thereof uh, approval of a carport only, subject to the conditions that are outlined in the, uh, in the staff report. Uh, the first one being the depth of the carport shall not exceed uh, a depth of 25 feet per the depth of the existing western wall of the home. That's one. Two, that it has to maintain a setback of three feet from the property line. And that the carport shall remain unenclosed except for a roof uh, to go over it. And that the roof line shall also meet that three foot setback requirement. What was your safety concern? Or what was the city's safety concern? Safety concern is based upon the proximity of homes of each other. Right. Uh, if, if there's enough room for an emergency apparatus to access the home, if there was a full enclosurement that extended far beyond a carport, you could say, towards the rear of the property. Uh, it, it, mainly it's about access and accessibility okay, of emergency. I understand that, mm -hmm. but the, the, the enclosed area. Yes. No wider than the carport. Well, from what they're saying, no, it's not. But on the flip side, we felt that, again, carport we could uh, somewhat provide and we could understand based upon the location of the driveway. And that's the logical sort of location, wherein the, the expansion of the home could take place towards the rear of the property and be in line with the required setback of seven and a half feet. So then you're saying, I, I don't understand your safety concern. So are you, are you suggesting that an emergency vehicle is able to get by a carport but not a mud room in back of it? No. So that it wouldn't be able to then make a left-hand turn to get to the back of the house? Well, what I'm saying is this. Even with the carport and the addition in place, they, an emergency... On the right hand. Right. The emergency aspect of it, they might not be able to get it from the right hand or even from the left hand side. If you, if you were to go out to the, to the site. I did. Right. We felt that it didn't provide necessarily the enough room for them to access over adjacent property to get onto the, the subject property in case of emergency. But more or less, more or less our argument is more from the house to the left than it is from the right and the proximity of that addition in relation to the proximity of the home to the left-hand side. So, we're on Toby. If, if they were to, instead of doing this entire proposed addition, if they were to cut the carport off right here, yes. but come over to the three-foot line, right. they're in favor of that. Yes, because they mentioned specifically that they needed at least 12 feet for a vehicle, for a single vehicle okay. to safely access that. Portion. So then, is there anything to prevent them from doing their proposed the addition, just not coming out quite as far, no. stay within the build line? As long as they stay within their building line, they're fine. And would that that additional, uh, I, I guess if they stay at the build line, you feel there would be enough room yeah, to get past the car forward, back into the backyard? Correct, because if they were to pr uh, gain, if, if emergency vehicle had to gain access from the property to the left, if, if you go out to the side, the, uh, the driveway sort of extends to the point where the carport would end. And to go beyond the carport extension into the extended living area, it may be more difficult for an emergency vehicle to access that portion of the property. Right, but I guess my, my 
point is that the carport is going to go right here anyway. Yes. All that two thirds of that carport is going to be blocked by that addition. Yeah. They build out to the property line. Right. Mainly, it's an art again. It's emergency, but it's also the difference between unenclosed and enclosed. Mm -hmm. That that's the main sort of argument from our end. Not just emergency vehicles, but firemen running through. Well, many, you know, there's going to be many factors that may be associated with it. We can't necessarily account for all, but, I mean, the main thing is you have an enclosed structure and an unenclosed structure. All right. Okay. That's my right. So that's 49. 50, uh, it's a request to reduce the rear yard setback from 40 feet to 16 feet. Uh, to enclose a rear deck and relocate the landing and stairs associated with the deck. And also as part of that um, sort of change, an increase in lock coverage from 35% to 40.7%. If you review the uh, staff report, initially we felt that the calculation provided by the applicant in terms of the proposed impervious coverage uh, didn't appear to be correct. So we went back and measured it. Um, but our initial measurement, I believe we sort of uh, ex exceeded what the requirement may be. And that's what we advertised for 40.7, which is not a bad thing because essentially when we re-reviewed re and recalculated uh, the lot coverage associated with the subject property, we determined that it's actually 36.6%. Currently. Currently. Or they proposed. Only need, proposed. proposed. They only need 366 Correct, not the 40.7 that we mentioned initially. Should we round it up and make it 37 just to be safe? <laughs> well, you are welcome to and do whatever you please. Is that just because of the difference between counting the entire deck versus a lot of that, uh, you know, two-thirds of yeah. the, the deck space underneath is already a concrete pad? In all honesty, the, the, the difference was we didn't have a clear indication of the scale okay. of the site plan. Uh, so once we were able to scale it out uh, to where we felt comfortable that was the appropriate scale, and when we recalculated, it came up to 36.6. I was unclear about the, the statement that follows. The recalculated lot coverage revealed that it exceeded the maximum allowable impervious coverage for R100 zone lots? Yeah, so R100 zone uh, property, the maximum is 35%. Okay. Percent. So we just wanted to reiterate the fact that uh, although they did not require it as part of their application because they were only seeking the reduction of the rear yard setback. Staff felt that it would be appropriate to also include it because it's an associated matter. Um, so with that said, we just wanted to make a distinction that within R100, 35% is the maximum uh, and they're exceeding it. So they're at 3277 now. In your calculations, are you counting that concrete pad under the deck as, as new impervious? No, no. And, and the thing is, we didn't want to necessarily go back and also calculate what they currently, currently have in place. It, I would assume that it's greater than 32. Okay. Um, but we only wanted to account for what we would be based upon the proposed. Need. Okay. Yes. All right. They're, they're just proposing 10-foot wide stairs instead of the current four, four and a half or four. Well, yeah. The thing is, as you can see on the, the – there's no uh, arrow there, but um, – on the north-hand side, you could say, at the top end of the, the subject property, you'll see that the uh, rear portion of the home juts out a little bit further towards the rear. They're relocating the deck or the landing and the stairs to the back end of that. If you go, Drew, if you could go to the other side plan associated with that. Have it up. Okay. Second page. Second page. So, Jed, that 10 feet is going to be yeah, go to the a set okay. going down. that will be about so, 5 feet and then another set when you turn coming down. So Jed, if you look at the screen, that's the proposed. So they're relocating the deck. What page is this? This is the part I don't understand. It just looks like, and I, I usually when you have a turn, it, there's an L, and there's no L. Yeah. I think what they're doing is they're coming onto this landing from the mm -hmm. deck, they're going down to another landing, and then down I see way. what you mean. Yes. I see what you mean. Way. Yeah, I see what you mean. Okay. And essentially, so that's uh, a landing in the middle, halfway right. down or yep. something. Okay. Right. Thank you. What is their lot coverage right now? Well, they're stating that their lot coverage stairs, is, I actually. believe, 32.77. And not really any different. 
coverage than if you just went straight down. You didn't find it to be any different from what right they're because it's short. Yeah, we didn't get into the Maybe what the they're representing as current. Bit, okay. Yeah, um, we were more concerned with what they were proposing, what the the law coverage would. We have equate any to neighbor the objections of record in this? We have received no objections. Okay. It's a vacant lot next to it. Vacant lot behind it. Yeah, and so uh, staff has recommended approval of the request uh, with, you know, conditions limiting the uh, limiting the law coverage to 36.6 percent. Next. All right. ZBA 1451 uh, is a request to reduce the average front yard setback from 122.4 feet uh, to 111.4 and also to reduce the side yard setback from 10 feet to 4.3 feet for the for a proposed home expansion. Um, as the property currently stands, uh, essentially what the applicant is uh, requesting to do is actually uh, what you would refer to as a pop top. It's a single story. They want to add a second story onto it. Um, the footprint of the building would stay the same. There is a small corner on the north hand side of the, pro uh, of the building itself that encroaches into the what you would consider the average setback of 122.4, but it's a minor encroachment. It's 2.8. Um, but the 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 reduction in the average front yard setback of approximately 11, well, 11 feet to be exact, is to account for the stairways, the stairway and steps associated with the porch, and to account for the sort of the topographic challenges leading from the driveway into the front entrance of the home itself. Um, so we felt that uh, staff could support that request. In addition to that, there is a stream buffer. It's not covered, right? It's not a covered porch or step. Just a roof. It's not unenclosed. I mean, it's not enclosed, sorry. The stairways would be covered. Not the stairway, just the porch portion. Okay. Yes. And uh, they do have a stream buffer, and that's why uh, the building is set back uh, or placed in its current position. Uh, as, part of this as part of this request, there is no impacts in terms of land disturbance associated with the stream buffer. Uh, in essence, they would be, essentially, they would be removing uh, existing impervious outside of the stream buffer, uh, which would be beneficial. In addition to that, the uh, uh, condition that would be if, will be that be covered by a site plan condition. The They're showing that on the site plan. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then the carport, as it currently stands, I believe it's set back uh, 5.5 feet uh, from 4. the property 5, line. 4.5, you said. Well, no, that's it's a 4.5 encroachment into the. So well, yeah. Okay. I'll make it simple from in terms of the perspective of the staff report. Yes, it's encroaching 4.5 feet. Um, they're wanting to uh, it's a two foot difference yeah, on the side see. isn't it aren't they just asking for two feet more uh, than they currently have on the side uh, let me just double check real quick just want to make sure I give you the correct so they're already encroaching 4.5 feet into the side yard setback. Actually, and they want to increase it to six point or five point seven. Not actually, uh, I, I, that was a typo. Per the site plan, is five point five feet. It's set back five point five, not point one. The, the existing carport. Okay, so that's in line. So in essence, they're asking to encroach one point two feet further into the side yard setback. That's why I was trying to figure right. out. It's plus one point two feet Correct. encroachment. Correct. Not much. And actually, the the depth of the carport would be uh, lessened. It would be shrunk with the portico share, and then they'll put in a, a second addition on top of the the, uh, the carport. You could say, in essence, which would function as an unfinished storage area. Uh, and we felt that again, in comparison to the adjacent home, there's enough room uh, for any type of sort of to consider any type of emergency situation. And we felt that that would be appropriate, and staff has recommended approval for both variances. And also, they they seem you know they seem to give the staff a whole lot more detail than most applicants. Yes. All these extensive drawings, elevations. I mean, that's nice. That shows serious. <coughs> yeah, they they def definitely put a lot of thought and consideration into that overall uh, renovation. Uh, lastly. Objection of record. No. Yet? And for all of the letters of support in there, good. Yeah, from the 
for most of these, um, except for the appeal, uh, we haven't received any opposition. Moving on to 1452, uh, it's a request to reduce the front yard setback along Mabry Oaks Drive from 35 feet to 31.5 feet, and also to increase lot coverage from 35% to 43%. Uh, in essence, the request has been uh, the, the request has been made uh, as part of the applicant's uh, wishes to locate a pool, and I believe to I believe to also expand or to include a sunroom uh, as part of the overall build. Um, previously, they received three separate variances from DeKalb County. Uh, one was on the. If you're looking at the, the site plan to the left-hand side, which is, uh, you consider that the front yard setback along Maybury Road. On that side, they, they, had, they received a reduction from 35 feet to 30 feet from the cab. They also received the reduction in the rear yard setback from 40 feet to, I believe, 26 feet. And also on the interior side yard setback, they received a reduction from 10 to 9 feet. Uh, we felt that based upon those previous uh, approvals from the cab uh, it provided them with ample room uh, in order to build uh, what it is that they wanted to build and, and also inclusive of a pool uh, we felt that if it was if we were to also allow for the reduction in the front yard setback of along Mabry Oaks Drive uh, from 35 to 30 31.5 feet uh, it actually may allow sort of um, then would it be safe to say from page 317 of the package that the building envelope or the building area for the corner lot across the street is smaller than the building area already in approved for this subject property? Well, let me check for you. Uh, it appears that way. Yeah. Lot 13. Right, lot 13 in is In comparison to one. Actually, lot 13, it's... Um, the gross square footage for lot 13 comes up as 16,623. And for lot one, which I believe is a subject property, uh, it's 15,382. So it's, even though it looks bigger on the drawing, it is actually smaller? Yes. Does everybody understand this is a brand new subdivision? Right. So this was laid out you know and again in the letter of intent and sort of going back to our, our training session in terms of uh, how we go about comparing similar uses within this within the same zoning district I know the applicant mentioned uh, numerous times in the uh, in their letter of intent that there are other homes within the R100 zoning district or maybe possibly even within this development um, that have the pool that has a pool uh, constructed on site um, but, again, to, to our recollection, we don't necessarily know, uh, we can't necessarily confirm, but this property could also have a pool on the property as long as it meets the requirements of the zoning district. And again, being that it's a planned development, it's a planned subdivision that came into place, uh, we felt that the variance as requested was not warranted, and so we have recommended denial. Would it appear to you that they have a potential buyer to build a contract house and and that buyer says hey I want it this lot if I can get a pool and that may be a condition of the contract it's really hard to say I, I don't know if it's necessarily like spec homes you could say or sort of uh, no, not a spec it's I'm not saying, well a buyer saying I'll buy this let you build the house if I can have a pool well, it seemed it, well it seemed big. like I'll tell you this it seemed like the the actual uh, property owner is much more involved if you looked at the letter of intent the the applicant is the owner I believe um, at Rockhaven Homes. Rockhaven Home is the developer. Right. Uh, but I believe uh, Mr. Moore would be the actual purchaser. Okay. But in the letter of intent, it, it appears that he was heavily involved in the sort of the design, the layout aspect. So we're saying you says, can have a pool, and there's a way to have a pool within the confines of our zoning. You said that they've already received three. They received three. From yes. The yes, they did. And they still want more. They still want the additional front yard along Mary uh, Oaks Drive, Berkeley. and also the lock coverage. Correction, the owner is Rockhaven Homes, oh. a subsidiary called Berkeley LLC, because it says the owner is Berkeley LLC, and Brad Hughes at Rockhaven Homes 
uh, is the uh, showing as the owner on the application. Right. I apologize. The uh, I believe from previous discussions with staff and a specific, uh, which I believe was the applicant. I see. Okay. So there are conditions of uh, on their end in terms of the purchase of the property. Okay, and that would conclude the, the cases for tonight. I'll move to adjourn. Second. <laughs> I'm sorry, second. I can't second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Good move.